Greetings and salutations, everyone, and I hope everyone's Christmas was wonderful. Before we get into tonight's second half, a couple links. As you know, I rely on Patreon, PayPal, and my merch to help the channel to continue to grow and go. The links to Patreon and PayPal are in the description below. My merch displayed directly under the video. Also, Dogman Frightening Encounters, Volume 1 through 3, the audiobook versions. They were written and researched by Tom Lyons, narrated and produced by me, Jeff Nadolny. Those audiobooks are available on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes, the links to which are also in the description as well. And finally, last but definitely not least, if you'd really like to help support this channel to continue to grow and go, simply subscribe, click the like button, and please leave a comment. It really does help, and guys, it definitely matters. And now, everyone, I have taken far too much of your time. Let's get on with tonight's Christmas second half, shall we? Today's first part of the upload. It was in early fall of 2007 that my hunting partner G and I had planned a two-day hunt near the San Juan National Forest. What started as a plan for an early departure late Friday night into early Saturday morning had gotten fouled up and we couldn't start my truck. G had shown up in his tercel after messing with my truck in the dark with flashlights for about an hour to no avail, we decided to head back to G's house and get his truck, which killed another couple of hours. Suffice to say, we had arrived at the area mid-morning instead of before sunrise. At any rate, we hiked into the area around Potato Lake, where we broke into some scrubland, at some point spotting a couple of mule deer in the process. Having seen nothing to our liking, and as the day progressed, G had suggested crashing in the woods that night, saving us the time of a return hike. Having missed out on the entire first morning of our two-day stint, well, we had enough grub to last, but we had no tent. However, the weather wasn't bad and we decided to rough it in hopes of a good morning hunt. To be honest with you, I don't sleep well on the best of nights at home and I wasn't looking forward to sleeping in the woods on my pack, which, as you will soon hear, didn't happen anyway. So the two of us had made our way into the trees at Potato Lake, stoked up a fire, and there we sat as the afternoon turned into darkness. And believe me when I tell you, it was dark. On several occasions, I had stepped away from the fire to take care of business, and I couldn't see the hand in front of my face. It was late, around one in the morning, that I turned my head and G was sound asleep, with his head on his pack. And I remember saying to myself, well, it's just you, me, and God for the rest of the night, as I sat staring into the flames. At about three in the morning, having not slept a wink, I heard the first sounds. They were what sounded like heavy footsteps coming from behind me, and I shook G from his sleep. Well, he jumped and said, what's wrong? And I told him to listen because something was moving in the woods. We were both armed, and our guns were now brought to ready position. We were now hearing what sounded like several different animals or whatever, moving about at different angles to where we stood. G was carrying a mag light, and I had a very bright LED headlamp as well. So we stood there shining our lights here and there in response to the noises we were hearing. And we could see nothing. This went on for about a half an hour, and then everything went silent. Although we were initially freaked out when the sound had stopped, we agreed that whatever had been there moved on. And about an hour later, G was sound asleep and I was still sitting by the fire wide awake. I think it was about 4.30 when the first stick or rock was thrown. At least that's what it sounded like. Having seen nothing and having not heard a sound coming from the woods, something that sounded like a stick or a rock hit the ground about 20 feet away from me on the other side of the fire's glow. Once again, I shook G out of his slumber, telling him what had just happened. He jumped to his feet, 
That's when things started to ramp up as far as action was concerned. Some odd grunts were coming from different directions and what sounded like something running through the trees, deliberately trying to make as much noise as possible in the process. With neither of us being able to see anything except for what we were describing as dark shadows or blurs of movement. It was the most terrifying event in my life. And, by the way, I was armed at the time. Now I will share this with you, that having a gun brings you little comfort when you cannot see your enemy, but they can see you. I guess there was a moment or two looking back at that night if I wondered my life was going to end. Thankfully, it had not. At one point, we heard what sounded like a dialogue in a deep kind of gibberish, similar to me saying to you something stupid like oogly boogly or some other nonsensical saying. For what seemed to be an hour, the thrashing of branches continued, with some other noises like this speech periodically, and then we began to see the glow on the horizon of the morning's first light. Morning could not come soon enough, and suddenly the woods were silent. We heard nothing leave, but we hadn't heard anything initially arriving either. It was as if phantoms had arrived and departed, having stopped to torment us in the process. As soon as it was light enough to hike, we began, having said to each other, we were going home. It was about two miles into the hike, with the entire landscape now glowing from the light of the morning sun, that several mule deer came bolting down the hill from our left, running right in front of us about 40 yards away. As we were watching them, an entire herd was following, perhaps 20 or more, some of which I saw were foaming at the mouth, a sure indicator of running hard to escape something. But what? We hadn't had time to so much as blink, and here comes this huge monster barreling down the hill in hot pursuit, with its arms and legs pumping like you can't believe. And it was gone to our right hand side in a split second. I mean, boom, 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 it was gone. The size of this thing was immense, with its hair flowing out behind its body and head as it ran. It seemed to have covered 20 or 30 feet with each stride, appearing like a track runner when they are leaping over hurdles. To me, it was more in the air than on the ground. Each time its feet hit, it was so fast, and it was airborne again. I am 100 certain that it had caught one of them at some point in time, but we weren't going to be there to find out. We could hardly believe what had just transpired before our eyes, but we both knew that it was that that had been taunting us in the woods that night. Now seeing this creature on the hunt, I can say speaking for myself and G, that I believe we were seen as a threat to the area's herd, and we were not welcome. It had to have been nine or ten feet tall, a thousand pounds, but... The way it ran was not an indicator of its size. This thing looked like a monster and ran like a gazelle. And it was mesmerizing to watch. I would say 30 to 40 miles an hour as compared to a car going by in the street. Just remarkable. Few people have heard what I just shared with you, but believe me, it happened. And we will never forget it. Today's second encounter. I'm 83 years old now, but at the time of this bizarre happening, I was 66, hard at work maintaining a large cattle herd in Montana. The way this thing had panned out was strange, but here goes nothing. I had sighted this creature several times throughout a period of about four years. Each time that I saw it was from a considerable distance, and on every occasion I watched as it walked away from or back into the forest. I don't know the how and the why as to just why it worked out the way, but that's the way it was, always leaving the trees or on its way back into them. I'd confided in a couple of my closest friends who were more than a bit interested, 
But we were all in agreement. No harm, no foul. Live and let live. But that was about to change. It was in 2000, and I was out in the herd one morning when I spied what looked like some type of large dead animal out in the adjoining pasture. I rode over to have a look-see. As I rode up on the animal, I realized immediately that it was one of my own. I dismounted my horse to have a closer look. Things got strange quickly the moment I left my horse. There was considerable damage to the body, but not in the usual way in regards to an attack from a bear or a cougar, which I will get into. The first thing I noticed was the animal's neck was twisted around at least twice if not more, giving the appearance of a wrung out towel. The next thing that I noticed was I was looking at the neck was a dried up blood puddle under its mouth, and upon inspection of the mouth, the beast's tongue had been torn and was gone. The belly of the animal had been torn or shredded open, not in a surgical way, but rather like ripping the flesh apart with no signs of bite marks or a knife having been used. As I lifted the flap of the hide, most of the organ meat was gone, and there was not a single claw mark or scrape on the skin. Well, this was the darndest thing I had ever seen in all of my days, and I had started a chain of phone calls to all my friends and the authorities on what had happened. You can't believe the commotion that this had stirred over the next several weeks with talk about everything from aliens to satanic cult activities and the likes. But in my heart, I was thinking Bigfoot possibly. After everything had blown over, I was very unsettled every time I was in the fields. And yet, I hadn't seen anything else. Let's just say that I was on guard and had my rifle with me at all times, whereas before it was usually my handgun that I carried. Based on what I had seen of this creature, it would take all that a rifle had to offer to bring it down, and for some reason I felt like a standoff was on the horizon. I don't even know why I had that feeling at the time. It was simply a gut feeling and nothing more than that. Seven months later, on a windy, cold day, that I was once again riding out to check on the herd, when as I approached the rise, I heard an animal acting up, and I set the horse to a trot, making it over the hill, where I could now see the herd. The animals were scattering every which way, and smack dab in the middle of the field stood a creature. There was no visible animals down, just this monstrous beast standing in the grass. I pulled my rifle from the scabbard and set to sight on him. And it ran like the dickens toward the fence. I was doing my best to follow him through the scope. But the way he was running, it was impossible. It was like a jackrabbit from hell darting left to right, as though it knew what it was in for. As soon as it hit the fence, it leapt over it, turning and stopping to face me for the briefest moment, and it was enough for me to get a shot off, which I did. The creature did not move or drop, and as I quickly chambered the second round, putting my scope back on it, through the scope I watched as it appeared to burn off from the edges inward and vanished. Please allow me to explain. Have you ever seen a piece of flash paper burn? When the flame touches the edge, it is consumed in a split second with no real smoke or residual process. It virtually vanishes before your eyes. That's what I saw without taking my eyes off the scene for a second. I rode straight away down to the fence dismounted with my rifle. I could see a trail going into the field and back to the fence where I now stood, as well as a set of very heavy and large footprints next to the rail where I had shot it and nothing else. The evidence was all there, that it was there, but where had it gone is anyone's guess. There was no blood, no sign of it having left the fence where it was standing. The thing was at least seven feet tall, dark brown when standing in the field. 
It ran faster than my horse could carry me, which is getting a move on. From that day forward, I never had another sighting of it or anything else happen on the property. And what it was all about, I can't rightfully say, but that's the way it happened. Today's third encounter. Up until the time I was 24, I lived in Minnesota after which I had moved to Dearborn, Michigan. Having graduated college and been offered a good paying job, Minnesota, as many already knew, is toted to be the land of 10,000 lakes. Truth be told, there are considerably more than 10,000 lakes within the state's borders, most of which are unnamed bodies of water. One of these formerly unnamed bodies of water was a half a mile from our home growing up, and by many of the locals, dubbed Demon Lake. Now the actual naming of this lake has entangled in local lore, with people sharing stories of so-and-so having seen a demon, or some creatures emerging from the lake, hearing piercing shrieks in night, and a host of other creepy things depending on who you spoke to and what you believe. As for myself, I didn't believe in any of it. As a young man, I fished the lake hundreds and hundreds of times, and other than the occasional thinking about things that I had heard, hadn't experienced anything that would frighten me in the least. As I fast forward some 15 years, my parents were moving to Florida, having offered me their property and the home I grew up in, knowing that I was kind of longing to move back. I had started a secondary business aside from my formal job, which could be run from virtually anywhere, and for the price of zero dollars and zero cents offered by my folks, I moved. One of the first things I did after returning was to walk over to the lake and fish. I had missed this little fishing hole, and now I was back. Now as lakes go, it's pretty small maybe three to four acres in size. It was in October of 1993 as winter was just beginning to make its presence known that I had gone down to the lake on a Saturday for what just may have been the last hurrah for the winter. There was a meandering trail that brought you to the lake that was some three or four hundred yards long in the woods from the looks of the trail, or should I say, what was left of it, nobody had been making use of it in a long time. The last time I had been here, it was a well-worn from kids' feet, bicycles, but that was 16 years ago, and this was now. I was enjoying the fact that I was back wandering through the trees on this windy Saturday, with the wind coming from directly behind me through the trees. Suddenly a horrific stench began to waft by me, coming from behind me in the way I had just traveled. It smelled like sulfur. I stood there momentarily thinking to myself that I hadn't smelt or seen anything coming in, in the form of a decaying animal lying in the woods. Surely I would have smelled such a thing on the walk in, but I hadn't. I thought my imagination was getting the best of me when I began to ponder the naming of the lake demon by the locals, but that quickly passed, and I kept walking. I was now standing on the lake shore, throwing a swimming plug around, when I realized that the stench of which I spoke earlier was gone, and I kept fishing. Some two or so hours later, standing in the bright sunshine, I was overwhelmed by a sense of fear. I had a hard shiver, and began to feel what I will describe as being depressed, my head began to hurt, and I felt as though there was a pounding on my back of my eyeballs. I know this sounds nuts, but it's the truth. Now sitting on a log with my head down, I was massaging my temples in hopes of getting some relief. With my plan now being to leave when I'm able, it was at this time that I looked up, with my view being that of the far shore of the lake, about 75 yards or so in front of me at that point, when my eyes caught a glimpse of something passing through the trees that appeared to be large and black. 
the visage of which was broken up by it passing in between and through many trees in the forest. At the very moment I had sighted this thing, every hair on my body tingled as a cold chill ran through me, causing my body to momentarily shake violently. Perhaps about thirty seconds later, this black shape appeared, coming out of the brush, looking like a screwed-up puzzle piece. It was absolutely jet black in appearance, but con completely lacking in anything distinguishable. At this distance, if it was a man or an animal, I would have seen eyes, the coloration of fur, and many other details, but it was simply a solid black shape. It began to move along the shore like a disjointed skeleton, the hinge joints which, as some would be at the knees and elbows moving randomly, like they were shaking left to right in and out. Picture a skeleton being held up by a rope from the head, with a person holding it, shaking the rope around, causing it to rattle and shake beneath. I was stunned, unable at that moment to breathe or move. It was shaped like a huge human of sorts, but with sharp and oddly placed angular shoulders, head, and appendages, and yet it was moving in what I will describe as a shuffle or a strange, disjointed walk. I was gasping for my next breath at that point, feeling near the point of collapsing, when I suddenly snapped free from the hold of whatever had come over me, and I ran like hell out of there. Although this was not Bigfoot related or any cryptid related, related I don't know, as best as I can say, I will never go down in those woods again to fish on that lake again. Like many others, I have never spoken of this event to anyone, including my family members. It was so shocking that it shakes me to my very core every time I think about it. Even writing this down to share with you now, there are things out there, the likes of which we will never know of, and frankly, I don't want to know of. Today's fourth encounter. It was 2012 I had gone into the Banff Forest elk hunting. The area in which I hunt is only 30 miles or so from my home, so whenever I am there it's always a day trip, and as such I travel light. In other words, no tent and very little in regards to supplies, just enough for a day and perhaps a little extra in case of an emergency. In 2012 I was 59. And although I am in reasonably good shape, I was in no way looking to hike a long way or in much elevation that day. This was fairly much going to be a walk in the woods, and if I happened to run across something, it would have been a bonus. In other words, I was hunting, but not so much, if that makes sense. It was a pristine day with blue skies and a very wispy cloud cover floating over the Banff. I had entered the forest at around 8 in the morning with my rifle slung over my shoulder, a light pack on my back. It was warm that morning that about a mile in I had taken off my coat and was wearing a heavy woolen pullover. It was about 11.30 that I found a nice area to sit for about an hour, and it was here that I would make my stand as far as seeing something to shoot was concerned. There was about a foot of snow in the woods, and within about 20 minutes, the wind kicked up as a gray cloud cover began to roll over me and light snow began to fall. I was only perhaps three miles into the woods and was in no way concerned about the weather, but I was in a small clearing where the snow was now landing directly on me, so I decided to move into a more favorable location putting me in a somewhat more sheltered position. The forest here is very dense, with a considerable amount of deadfall everywhere, causing one to be very careful where you step in the snow, not being able to see what is buried beneath. So I was slowly making my way into the area, where there was more overhead cover to protect me. While I sat, I have to say at this point, that unlike many of the accounts which people have shared, I did not have any sense of being watched or a feeling of fear. Yet yeah, it was quiet, so much so 
that I could hear the snow hissing as it fell to the ground, but other than that, nothing to me seemed out of the ordinary. I felt very much at ease and peaceful, but that was about to change. I don't think I had walked 200 feet when a red stain in the snow caught my eye just ahead of me, and to my right in the snow it appeared just as a cherry snow cone would that you may buy at the carnival, pure white snow stained in red about four feet in diameter. It was blood. Understand me, please. There was deadfall everywhere and thousands of small scrubby brush trees and undergrowth as well as tall trees with this pure white snow covering the forest floor, I realized that something had been killed here and began to scan the area for the carcass and or predator. As my eyes moved to the left, I had now taken my rifle from my shoulder and was holding it at ready in front of me when I saw the carcass of what appeared to be the remains of a small deer splayed or draped over a low branch belonging to a small tree. The entire skeleton was visible with very little flesh still attached, which was still bloodied. This hadn't been hanging on this branch for long, I can assure you of that. The branch was only maybe 20 feet away from me. As I now was slowly scanning the area, trying to look through and around every brush and tree in the vicinity, having now done so, my eyes were drawn back to the carcass, maybe ten feet away. Just to the right of where this carcass hung was a cluster of three trees, two narrower ones, maybe a foot or less thick, and one large one with a diameter of maybe three feet, I'd say. For whatever reason, I had noticed earlier that the bottom segment of the thicker tree became narrower at about 10 feet from the ground, and that's when I saw movement. At the 10 foot mark, I saw a swift, which causes me to concentrate more carefully, now realizing that this was a beast of mammoth proportions leaning quite still flush against the side of this tree. When I then saw a black eye blink, it was covered from head to toe with a dark chocolate brown shaggy fur sprinkled with snow, the face being almost indiscernible from the rest of its body. If I hadn't seen the head twitch an inch, followed by a blink of an eye, I wouldn't have even noticed it. Realizing I was now standing up close and personal with an enormous creature, I slowly started to backtrack as though I hadn't seen anything. I was now about 40 feet away and the creature had not moved from the tree when my eyes caught a glimpse of something gray through an opening close to the ground of the branches of the brush. What I saw was gray like squirrel's fur. It then turned ever so slightly to the right as I now realized I was looking at the back of something's head of yet another creature squatted on the ground. It had short, light gray fur unlike the other being long and dark brown. My heart began to race, continuing to move, stepping ever so slowly away, yet another small deer became visible lying on the ground in front of this gray creature it also being dead but not torn apart as of yet. I spent no additional time looking as I now increased my stride to get as far po as possible without seeming hurried in the process. Soon I was a couple of hundred feet away and as I turned to look as best as I could see neither of them had moved. They were in complete stealth mode. In a moment, part of me wanted to squeeze the trigger on the first, and I don't know quite why I didn't do so. It would not have been for the sake of just killing it, but rather to save myself from an impending doom. But it's a good thing I didn't. The other one would have jumped on me, if not both of them, and torn me to pieces limb from limb. I have to say that they simply stayed where they were perfectly still as I had entered the area 
not willing to give up their prey, apparently waiting to see what would fall out with my actions. When I was well away from them, my heart began to suddenly race and I began to tremble violently. Whether or not this was some type of delayed reaction to the fear I had felt, I can't say, but I was freaking out. It was about three o'clock. I was out of the woods and turned back to look over to the forest I had just come from. I was amazed at how calm I was able to react in that moment I had seen them. Had I reacted differently, who knows what would have happened. The one leaning on the tree had to have been about a thousand pounds, or what looked to be. With the one crouched down, perhaps four or five hundred. The two of them looked entirely different. One had short hair, the other had long. One had gray, one had brown. One larger, one smaller, having killed two small fawns and gathered together to eat. I will never enter any forest the same way again, knowing now what I do that creatures exist in these woods. They obviously could have taken me out, and perhaps they would have if they hadn't already scored these fawn. I guess I should consider myself more than a little lucky. I have to say that I've learned a little something that day. At least that's the way I feel. These two beasts had chosen the same area that I had to to hunt. There was nothing about the spot that said, this is a camp for lack of a better word. It also reminded me that there were no rules to their style of hunting. Smaller is better and easier as far as prey, which told me they are opportunist, if not downright smart. Every predator will go for the smallest, weakest, slowest animal they can find. They are not proud. It's all about an easy meal. Since these two creatures were together, with one kill being all but eaten and the other still whole, I believe that they were hunting as a team and sharing the spoils. I do consider myself damn lucky that I had shown up after dinner. Who knows what, have ha what would have happened if I had arrived at dawn. What I saw of the remaining meat on those bones was hours old, not days. They had eaten what they had caught in the early morning and had already taken advantage of another, based on the size of the one that was standing. I would have had to say it could eat a fawn a day. It was that big. I know what I saw, and that's the end of that whole matter. Today's Final Encounter In the summer of 2008, my team of ghost hunters and myself were investigating a graveyard in the Henniker, New Hampshire, for paranormal activity. We were equipped that night with several EVP recorders, as well as a spirit box. The spirit box reportedly scans thousands of frequencies, through which is said that spirits can be caught talking while it's on. The EVP device are used to record answers to your questions as well, but in a different format. Don't ask me how these things work. I only know how to use them. The EVP generally picks up things that you have not heard with your natural ear, while Spirit Box runs continually making a loud hissing sound and or static, through which we can hear random things being said. Now, as a team, have investigated hundreds of graveyards regionally, as well as many haunted houses, so this was just another night on the job. As fate would have it, all night we were getting random hits, as we call them, with spirits answering our questions and yes and no answers, and a variety of other responses, but it was in actuality all the stroke of midnight that the freak show began. We started to pick up frequent and loud unmistakable growling sounds on the spirit box, which we generally associate with demonic entities. This was going on for about a half an hour continuously when my friend said, look at that. He was pointing into the woods where there was a pair of red glowing eyes, widespread and glowing brightly some 10 feet off the ground. 
I turned the flashlight on it and saw nothing as the glowing eyes disappeared simultaneously with the light coming on. The group was freaking out now, with it being the first time something of this nature had occurred. You had to be there fully to understand what I just shared with you. Collectively, we had a kind of regroup and calm down, which we did before beginning again to make further contact. One of the group members was weeping profusely sitting with her back against a large grave marker. Before we could even begin again, all of us were trying to console her into staying. If not, we were going to have to leave, so we were all crouched down trying to calm her down. Our other friend, being the only one still standing, screams, Oh my God! We all looked as the woman exploded into tears and sobbed. The red eyes had now reappeared, now moving side to side and coming toward us. We grabbed the woman and started to run with the rest of what I am going to say having been told to me by two of our companions. The two of them had stood their ground when we fled as the entity, according to them, came into view. They reported it as a large, hairy, massive creature, almost resembling a Sasquatch, but with some sort of muzzle. Our friend had put his flashlight right on it, and this time it remained in full view of them, rocking from side to side in the darkness. Both of them said that it started to advance toward them, exploding into a flash of blue light, as an orb now appeared to float away into the woods. At this point, our friend said that all of their electronic devices went dead, the batteries having been mysteriously drained by the event, with there being no other rational explanation for them to die. I am not a cryptozoologist. I am a ghost hunter, but... What we experienced that night opened our eyes to an entirely different reality. Was it a Bigfoot or Dogman growling on the spirit box? I can't say for certain, but what I can say is this. The event most certainly happened, with four witnesses being present. All right, everyone, I hope you all enjoyed tonight's second half. Once again, Merry Christmas. I hope everyone had a wonderful day with your family and friends. And if not, know that I was thinking of all of you. So please stay safe. May the Great Spirit watch over us all or whoever you worship. I just say Great Spirit because, well, it's kind of all-encompassing, I guess. And um, even though I do wear a cross, uh... Today was Jesus' birthday, so, you know, let's never forget that. It's not about presents, gifts, this, this, and that. It's about the birth of the Christ child, and he would want us to be happy and with our friends and family, and if not, just to be happy. So, have a good night.